It should not surprise us then that for the first time since 1914, as of two years ago, we are a debtor nation. It shouldn't surprise us that we're importing more food stuff than we're exporting as of one year and a half ago. I didn't know that. Yes, That's sir. Incredible. It shouldn't surprise us that uh, our international trade deficit, which is absolutely impossible to continue to support. At this moment, we're really susceptible to the decisions made externally overseas because Reagan's whole economy has been funded by the foreign investments and foreign investments in banks. I've seen some quotes from people who say the next president of the United States is going to be the next Herbert Hoover. Well, if we're lucky, uh, the situation will wait that long. <laughs> Let me put it that way. <laughs> if we're lucky. Congressman Henry Gonzalez from San Antonio is as well informed as he is outspoken. He tells us about the problems with an endangered species, the Western capitalist economic system, right now on Alternative Views. Congressman Henry Gonzalez participates in some of the most significant committees in the House of Representatives, like banking and currency. He knows what is happening in the world and how close we are to a depression. In fact, perhaps the collapse of the whole Western capitalist system. But before we talk to him, we'll have some news stories. Several years ago, if you've been watching Alternative Views, you remember that the Spotlight had a story about how the Rockefellers were taking over the drug world through their banking system. And people think, oh yeah, it's those crazy right-wingers again. However, what they reported was that the Rockefellers had taken over the particular banks in Hong Kong and in Colombia and others in South America that had historically been the financiers for the drug operations. Going back even as far as the Opium War days back uh, uh, in, in Hong Kong with the British. Well, now the Rockefellers own that. Now, later on, the spotlight noted a few years later that the banks had set up havens for complete free and unregulated operations down in Panama. So that brings us up to date what's, with what they're reporting on now. They're saying that at least $40 billion a year of dope money is cycled into our economy from the dope people through these big uh, Rockefeller and establishment banks. And what happens is that uh, flights come in from Panama and Venezuela, bringing the cash. The cash is then deposited in the uh, big uh, banks, Chase Manhattan, sitting uh, Corp and so forth. And uh, almost all of the deposits go to the so called offshore corporate accounts maintained by these uh, Panamanian uh, banks, which are in fact the uh, Rockefeller uh, banks, who serve as the clients for the, the drug people who are unable to launder their uh, money by themselves. So then this money goes to the United States, where it then is reinvested in uh, uh, stocks, bonds, money market, real estate, other profitable businesses. And, which is something that's really maybe have more in significance and maybe uh, shred light on some America's foreign policy, more and more of these drug deposits are invested in U.S. Treasury bonds. Right? Now, almost $3 billion worth of Treasury stocks were bought in 1985 in this manner. 
So, as, a, as Spotlight says, Colombia, uh, Colombia may be may be a debtor nation, but the Colombian drug cartel will emerge as one of this country's largest creditors. And if you in the capitalist system, if you're a creditor, well, you got them right there, right? <laughs> you do what we say. Well. This is one reason a lot of people, including FBI uh, people who requested not to have their names uh, printed, said that the Reagan administration's anti-drug campaign is a sham because they're really helping the drug cartel all the time. So we've always wondered what motivated the Rockefeller brothers to take such an active interest in Latin America and uh, where, after all, not much mega banking was done in the old days. And now they realize that they've why these Wall Street banks set up this new banking system down in Panama. Chase, of course, is the Rockefeller family financial flagship, and it's allied with uh, uh, all, most of the, all the other big banks. It will have an excess of $140 billion in 1987, the end of 1987, with these deposits on the books from their Panamanian subsidiaries. Dope money right most of it uh, the sad fact is that narcotics have become to represent Latin America's leading export commodity according to drug enforcement uh, administrator said history will record that this is a tragedy but the Rockefellers foresaw it as an opportunity for unprecedented profits mm. so now US American debt is owned mainly by the Japanese the Western Europeans and the drug lords <laughs> That's a while. See, that reported on CBS. Yeah, right. <laughs> Who, whose prime, who, most of whose stock is owned by Chase Manhattan and Citicorp. You probably won't see that too soon. <laughs> I got something out of the Village Voice. This was back in January 5th, and it was, it was a, a little bit of speculation. It was a little bit wild. They're talking about the crash, October 19th. And this article was called Snow for the Holidays. Stocks stumble, but spirits soar. And basically, what this this is a, a continuation of uh, an examination of the drug trade on Wall Street. Now, you may remember a couple of years ago, I did a report from the Wall Street Journal that said that there was a veritable blizzard blowing through the boardrooms of corporate America <laughs> of cocaine. Well, uh, Dave Lindorf in the Village Voice uh, takes this one step further. He says, for instance, he notes that uh, the two major stock exchanges, the New York and the American, have recently contracted with firms to provide drug counseling and treatment for their employees. And the Commodity Exchange plans to follow suit this month. Uh, he, he asks the question, how much drug use is there on these exchanges? Well, he says, a trader who works on the floor of the Comex in New York's World Trade Center estimates drug use there among exchange employees and employees of member firms at an astonishing 65%. He says, quote, people on the floor feel com completely safe about using and even buying and selling drugs. The exchanges are closed societies. Everybody knows who's using drugs and who's selling them, but nobody does anything. We've had people pass out from overdoses on the floor. They get carried out and everybody knows, but nothing ever happens. Well, uh, this is just one man's opinion, of course, but a, a top-ranking Comex official he says that drugs, particularly marijuana and cocaine, are, quote, running rampant on our trading floor and on all the other trading floors in the city. We have a policy that if you take drugs on the floor, you're out. But people can get high in the bathrooms or outside in the morning or at lunch, and nothing happens to them. I can walk into the bathroom anytime and find people down there snorting coke and smoking joints. Uh, of course, it's pretty obvious that there's a lot of uh, money around there, there's a, there's a lot of tension, uh, and this is basically what, what the article says. And the, one of the main reasons nothing is done about this, uh, he writes, is that if word got out that a firm's employees were using drugs, he says many invest investors might feel their Black Monday losses were not necessarily due to unfavorable economic trends. They might even consider suing their brokers for negligence for having these druggies on their staffs. And one possible reason why drug testing has been avoided, for the most part, on the exchange. And he concludes in the article, he says, So far, financial analysts are at a loss to explain the crash of 87. Many have, in fact, said it defies logic. Perhaps they should look into the frenetic and often paranoid behavior in the pits last October, when the financial markets acted for all the world like John Belushi on a tear. And I think that about says it. 
I mean, uh, you wouldn't want the pilot of a, a guy flying you to New York uh, or, say, a doctor who's going to to cut open your heart to be high on drugs, but nobody seems to say or do anything when the people who control our entire economic <laughs> system are uh, skating around high as kites. Mm -hmm. The spotlight always keeps track of who is owning what in the country, particularly as it affects foreign investors in the United States. It says that foreign investors now own about 25% of the 53 million square feet of Washington office space, and economists expect the percentage to go even higher with a weak dollar, making attractive the real estate markets in the United States. Foreign investors also own about 53% of Los Angeles office space. They ought to come here to Austin, where nobody's in those big buildings. <laughs> have them all. Sell it to them. They can have every one of them. <laughs> There's another thing for the spotlight. It shows about the weirdo nature of our economy. More than 60 million acres of cropland were removed from production in 1986 to curtail grain. No, 1987 to curtail grain surpluses while breakfast food companies were importing oats. Hmm. During 1988, the United States expected to import more than 30 million bushels of oats to fill the gap left by American farmers. Every once in a great while, I'll string together a couple of seemingly unrelated articles under a generic title, Rich Man, Poor Man. I have a couple articles here that I thought pretty well fit that category. First of all, a poor man's luck is illustrated in these two bits from the Utney Reader of March 1988. Uh, one little piece says, the Virginia Corrections Department is air conditioning the state penitentiary's windowless, windowless death chamber. <laughs> and they say that's to make it more comfortable for everybody. <laughs> Isn't that a poor man's luck? Another little thing that went along with that, they say, this guy, Johnny Powers, a 43-year-old who's been serving a sentence at the Lakeland Correctional Institute for bad checks and robbery, he was scheduled to, uh, he was actually eligible for parole next January. But unfortunately, uh, as a work release inmate, he smuggled eight cans of beer into the prison on Christmas Eve. And now his lawyer says he's going to have to serve an extra 15 years in prison for that. Well, for a rich man that's down on his luck, things might go a little bit differently. The Texas Observer, February 26, had a pretty good example of this, I think. It mentioned old John Connolly and his run of bad luck. We've seen his face in Texas popping up quite a bit recently in advertisements for financial institutions. Uh, the Observer notes that there's a full-page ad in the Fort Worth Star-Telegram, and we had it here in Austin. It's a 12-inch high mugshot of John Connolly, and it says, John Connolly on the importance of saving. It goes on to say, <laughs> this is, uh, they quote John Connolly, he says, quote, things haven't quite worked out like we'd planned. No kidding, John. And he says, but there's no better place than Texas to start over and to save a little something. And we've been seeing this on TV and in all different newspapers, et cetera, et cetera. Well, the Observer notes that besides the income he's now getting from working these advertising, he's picking up an extra 24000 a year. Uh, that's for serving on the board of the Coastal Corporation. He was recently elected to that. And then Mike Royko, in a syndicated column out of Chicago, came up with a little, another little item about John. Uh, Mike writes, uh, speaking through Slats Grobnik, who's one of his characters, he says, Connolly's new life might not be terribly difficult in light of the fact that he's getting $60,000 a year pension, because he's a former governor, and he's also, he also gets to keep his ranch. Old Slats says, quote, put me in a big house on 200 acres with 60 grand a year, and I'll keep my chin up and start a new life, too. A good example of the difference between rich man and poor man, Craig, is shown in a column by Mike Royko, which I saw in a, well, one of the Dallas newspapers. And uh, it talked about poor old Ivan Boski, you know, the white-collar criminal who was sentenced to prison. By God, we're getting tough on these white-collar criminals. We're going to send them to prison. Well... First of all, before they sent him to prison, he'd made, you know, hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars on insider trading, uh, trading in the stock market. And uh, so they find him a couple of hundred million, which is, oh, wow, well, that, they'd tear me up they find me a couple of hundred million. But not all Ivan, he had plenty left over. In addition to this, they let him sell off his regular stocks, and they said they had to do it in an orderly manner so it wouldn't disrupt the stock market. So he was allowed to make $50 million in profits off of the stocks that he'd already been convicted of being a bad boy about. But.
The main point that Mike Roycoy was making was that here he's sent to this white-collar criminal prison where they have tennis courts and golf courses and all kinds of pretty things and stereos and hi-fis and movies and VCRs and it's a minimum prison and you could walk away if you wanted to. You have... Uh, you, you can have your family come in and visit. You don't have to look at them between the, you know, these uh, uh, big, thick windows. It's just like, a, just like a country club, really, except you just can't go home every night. You can work on your college degrees. They have people come in and, and uh, teach them college courses if they want to. So it's really very nice. And the thing that Jimmy Breslin said, here, this clown is a convicted felon. And he's living better at government expense for three years than multi-millions of Americans are who are poor and who are homeless. The rich take care of their own. Now we're going to find out what's happening with the American economic system with Henry Gonzalez, congressman from San Antonio. And as is usual with Congressman Gonzalez, we're going to hear things that other Congress people won't tell you, even if they were as well informed. Uh, Congressman Gonzalez, now you're on, I always have difficulty keeping track of all the different committees and subcommittees you're on, and uh, I know you're involved in the, you're a ranking member of the Banking and Banking. Currency Committee, but they've changed the name of that, haven't yeah, they? Yeah, it's no longer Banking and Currency, it's Banking, Finance, and uh, Urban Affairs. And you're also on the Small Business Committee? Yes. And the what, Housing and Community I'm the chairman of the Housing and Community Development Subcommittee and the Banking Committee. Okay, well, my gosh, you're right in the middle of, uh, of what's going on in the economy I have been. again. I have if you been. were a banker, if your last name was Rockefeller, then you'd know everything, I guess. Well, let's talk about the economy. We, I've seen some quotes from people who say the next president of the United States is going to be the next Herbert Hoover. Well, if we're lucky... Uh, the situation will wait that long. <laughs> Let me put it that way. <laughs> if we're lucky. I, for one, being a depression kid, hopes it never happens. Uh, when I speak in a way that seems uh, critical to some ears, and they begin to say, well, that's partisan talk, uh, I'm really hoping that I'm wrong. Nobody prayed more than I did during 14 months that I was taking the House floor and asking the President what the military mission was of the Marines in Beirut, that I would be wrong. I knew they were in danger. I knew that the President's basis that he was sending them as peacekeeper was absolutely absurd. And so there was nobody who cringed more, felt more hurt than I was when the 241 died. It's the same thing with interest rates. It's the same thing with uh, some of us have been speaking out on these subject matters since the first year we got to the Congress. In 1963, for example, the uh, secretary then was supposed to be the outstanding expert, Dillon, right. came in and asked us to uh, revoke the silver transactions tax. What's that? Well, the silver transactions tax was imposed during the war in order to avoid speculation Oh. and to ensure that the war effort would not uh, be forsaken in the case of silver. And when I asked him what impact that would have and would it not bring uh, such things as the heavy speculation in the silver markets, uh, his answer was no, that it was a wartime measure it should have been revoked. I said no, but the conditions that dictated it at the time are still prevalent. Now this was C. Douglas Dillon, who yes. himself was an investment banker. But he was a he was a bond. Said. He was he came from Wall Street. Mm -hmm. And yet, when I said, "Well, it seems to me that given the situation of the facts you're giving us, the heavy industrial use, blah blah blah, that it won't be long before we will have to demonetize our currency. That is, take the silver out of the currency. Remember that at that time, even the nickel had a little bit." And uh, he came in exactly two years later, to the month, in April 65, and asked us to demonetize the uh, 
coinage, and you now had the terrible speculative fevers. Uh, you had the bunker fatal attempt to corner the silver market. It was crazy, it was foolish. A dumb Texan thinking he could outwit these uh, people in the London and Zurich markets <laughs> that had been in that business for 400 years it was absurd. But they, he, but they, he tied they, they set him up and they knocked him off, didn't but, they? <laughs> but he tied up over $30 billion worth of banking assets and resources that should have been a portion for the commerce and trade and the firing of our factories and the engines of, of our productions instead of these speculative, uh, wasteful efforts. And instead of that, we have had a gargantuan uh, activity in which these conglomerates and uh, dinosaurs swallow each other up. They're tying the resources of the credit allocations of our country. They don't produce one job. They don't produce one good. It should not surprise us then that for the first time since 1914, as of two years ago, we are a debtor nation. It shouldn't surprise us that we're importing more food stuff than we're exporting as of one year and a half ago. I didn't know that. Yes, sir. Incredible. It shouldn't surprise us that um, our international trade deficit, which is absolutely impossible to continue to support. This is what is uh, bothering these uh, other central bankers in these other countries in the industrial world. Uh, we shouldn't be surprised that uh, uh, we're no longer a producing country. As of five years ago, we're an importing country. And there's cause and effect. And the cause and effect is simply that you cannot impose and install the type of uh, fiscal and monetary and economic policies that this... Um, uh, government, this administration, and the Congress going along mostly, and such runaway entities, uh, the CIA of the financial world, the Federal Reserve Board, without the consequences we're having now. What about the Federal Reserve Board? This isn't discussed much at all, except in the right wing. Now, the right wingers talk about it all the time. They do. Tell us about the Federal Reserve Board. Most people in the textbooks, they say, well, it's it's uh, something which is quasi-government, but it's not government, it's taken out of politics. No, it's not a government entity at all. It's not a federal agency at all. It is the private commercial bank institution, but which through its operations has turned out to be wholly controlled by the seven, eight largest banks in our country. There's no question of that. The really? same Rockefeller Morgan banks that have been controlled. There's no question of that. No question. Of the, uh, the Open Market Committee and its emergence in 1923 was a fatal turning point. Then its uh, enhancement in the 1952-53 uh, Eisenhower era, uh, in which, in effect, the uh, constitutional mandate that the Congress be responsible for the coinage and the currency was literally abolished because uh, you do not see any longer. When I went to the Congress, and that was almost 26 years ago, if you had $21 bills in your pocket, about 18 of the 20 would say Treasury notes. Mm -hmm. Today, every one of them is a Federal Reserve note. What that means simply is that you're paying interest on every one of those dollar bills that are being manufactured by the Federal Reserve Board. And it's not accountable to the president. It's runaway. It's not accountable to the Congress. It's independent, they say. It wasn't structured that way originally, but that's what it is today. It seems that even some of the liberal uh, bankers and uh, investment bankers and advisors of the Rockefeller Group, the people who supported Carter and all, and who went along with Reaganomics for a long time, people like Felix Rohatton, they're saying now that Reaganomics is a disaster and that we have an impending severe depression coming up and we may not be able to come out of it uh, as a great economic uh, country for many, many years. 
Is this uh, fear being shown anywhere up in Congress? or? Uh, well, there have you? been uh, utterances. Uh, I have spoken out pretty strongly, as I say, over a period of almost 25 years. Of course, at the time, their interest rates, nobody ever dreamed you would be paying more than uh, five and a half, six percent interest rates. And uh, it was to no avail. It was like talking out in the brush country, uh, nobody hearing. And uh, the fact that it's just one of those things we pray constantly that it won't happen. We know that since about 1979, the potential is there. Uh, the uh, international markets have been in a constant state of chaotic flux. Every day there are some 400 to 500 billion dollars going every day around the capital markets, London, Paris, Bonn, New York, um, uh, Sydney, Australia, Tokyo. And those are dollars chasing dollars. They're not moving trade. They're not paying for goods. They're not buying goods. They're not creating employment. They're merely buying dollars, speculating, selling dollars to make more money on the purchase of dollars. When I asked the Federal Reserve Board, uh, the former Federal Reserve Board, Volcker, just six weeks ago about that, he said, oh, you're modest in your estimate. He said, I said, well, what can you do about it? He said, I don't know what we can do about it, except maybe we ought to have uh, better policies. I said, like what? If you don't have any control, it means that no matter what policies we devise domestically, we can't control it. He didn't say anything to that. But it's evident of how out of control the former semi-stabilized international currency markets had been. The other thing that's not even discussed, I'm the only one in the whole Congress that has even mentioned it, is the emergence of the European Currency Unit, the ECU, mm -hmm. and the European Monetary System, the EMS. That was first unveiled in the May summit, economic summit meeting in Bonn when President Carter was there. But nobody even, it was the last line in the communique but it wasn't fleshed out until May 1985 in Bonn at the summit economic meeting that Reagan went to. But reading the newspapers, you'd think Reagan had gone to place a wreath at the Nazi cemetery at <laughs> Pittsburgh. But actually, he was told, and our money men were told, we have fleshed out the ECU, the EMS, and as of about three and a half months ago, the Japanese for the first time moved in heavily into that system. Now is that actually uh, a new currency which the European uh, common market is What using? it means is, that, is that that is offered as a substitute for the dollar as a reserve unit throughout oh, the world. Oh, oh my, that, that is a big difference. Of course it is and it has ominous implications for the country uh, even despite the fact that at this moment we're really susceptible to the decisions made externally overseas because Reagan's whole economy has been funded by the foreign investments and foreign investments in banks. When those foreign investors in the Chicago, uh, Illinois, the uh, Mercantile Illinois in Chicago, uh, pulled their money, it collapsed. And we nationalized it, but we don't call that. Uh, if it were in Mexico, we'd say the government nationalized it. Here, the feds, the Federal Reserve pumped about six billion dollars of the taxpayers' money and actually is running the show, uh, but it cost us that much. And the crisis, it had been in crisis, but the real crisis became immediate when these foreign investors got nervous and they pulled it out. When interest rates go here, they want to pull them out. This is a reason why Volcker has insisted on trying to maintain some high interest rate stability to keep that money here. It's volatile, it's, uh, in my opinion, untrustworthy, and it places us wholly at the mercy of some foreign external forces over which we have no control. Well, now, if the people in Europe have gone to the ECU instead of the dollar, 
that means they lack the confidence in the dollar. Well, that they, also mean they may not want to uh, right. uh, to uh, underwrite our debt any further. Exactly. That's the danger point. What about the arms race? Now, this uh, Rohatton, Ro for the first time, and a couple of other economists are for the first time starting to say, well, the arms race is going to kill us economically. You know, the other people have been uh, saying that, uh, you know, these so-called radicals or mavericks have been saying this uh, for a long time, but not the people in the establishment arena. But now they're getting scared about what the arms race is it's doing. It's too late. It's too late. Yeah, uh, you had these uh, figures flying in their jumbo jets with built-in jacuzzis, <laughs> arm merchants. Uh, if our ships are attacked by a rocket by the Iranians, it'll be the silkworm which Iran obtained from China which got the permission because of the secret deal that Weinberger and President Reagan entered into when they visited China. They were able to get permission from the American license holder and the British manufacturer of that rocket to own it and sell it. So they sold it to Iran. It'll be ironic if our sailors are killed by those missiles that we enable the Chinese to sell to Iran. Uh, South Africa, for instance, uh, has benefited from these uh, traffic deals in uh, these death-dealing weapons. The um, merchant knows no nationality, and the forces are so powerful. See, this is where Secord was involved privately after he left the service. General Secord. Yeah, and, and a lot of others, but uh, not mentioned. Uh, but the third world countries today are deriving most of their monies from the sale of armament, believe it or not. The third world countries certainly are getting from the, the third from the uh, armaments which they are selling. Even the state of Israel. Oh yes, Israel. Yeah. Its biggest source, or one of the biggest source of income, is that. But it's not alone. I mean, uh, you have every other country hmm. from uh, West Germany to, well, Russia and the United States are the two principal merchants. What about the enormous outlay for arms? Couldn't that be cut and get... The as long as the world, and particularly the United States, is taxing the American people, in our case, $315 billion, of which 60 to 65 percent is for the so-called defense of Europe. Now, that's my estimate. I can't get anybody in the Congress, Chairman of Appropriations, Chairman of Defense, Chairman of Appropriations for Defense, tell me what is the dollar amount exactly. When I say, well, is it in the ballpark or in the range of 55 to 60, they say, yeah, that's correct. But that is based on a 1947 Europe, which is gone forever in a day. We're going to be embarrassed. We're going to be kicked out of Europe. We have 300,000 of our troops in Germany alone. We like to say that they are defense troops. We change the designation from occupation to defense. But ask the average German citizen how he looks upon it. It was at a time in 47 when the fear was an overland invasion by Russia. Through the years when the sober people were saying, you're crazy. Uh, the Russians may be very dumb and they may be very stupid but they can't even handle their own immediate satellite nations what would they do wanting to come and take france and what can we do about it in 1947 it was one thing in 57 we were talking about allowing the german figure on the trigger meaning on the bomb that's still the issue germany is still the issue the unification reunification of germany is still the issue but nobody talks about it in America. What about the banking uh, situation? We see uh, many, many scores of banks fail. We see the savings and loan industry just uh, almost in a state of collapse. That's right. Uh, what's going to happen to the banking system, and what effect will this have on the economy? It seems to me that um, there again 
all of the uh, patchwork, the uh, legislation passed in 1982, despite some of our protests, uh, we're not going to save the SNLs and are not. Uh, they're not going to do it, that, do it now in Texas. You've had many more banks this year since January the 1st fail than SNLs. Oh, really? That's right. But it doesn't mean that SNLs that are functioning outwardly are not dead. They are. There are about 135 of those that are dead in the water. And the thing that I objected mostly when we had the legislation to recapitalize the federal insurance uh, loan fund um, was um, that the GAO told us a year and a half ago that it would take $23 billion to do the work that had to be done in order to make sure that you, a small investor, trustfully placing your money in this SNL that's dead already, uh, would be, have some protection. Uh, it will take the Congress appropriated after debate. Now, last year we passed a bill that had $25 billion. This year we had a struggle because the savings industry and others uh, didn't want more than uh, $5 billion. It will take over six and a half billion just to take care of the Texas situation. And that's more or less what the Congress approved nationally. So we are in dire straits. Uh, what can be done at this late hour to save uh, some, I believe, should be to concentrate on those that can be saved and to recognize the, the uh, mortality of the others and, and protect the innocent depositor. I was talking to a person who is involved in um, helping to finance and put together real estate deals. And this person was telling me that many, she's, uh, they use the word uh, hundreds of SNLs in San Antonio and Austin, big cities, were actually in receivership, but they weren't talking about it and were actually being run covertly by the uh, FSLIC. Is this, uh, could this be true? Well, if the, FS not being publicized? if the FSLIC is running it, it's not going to be too covert, but what you did have... It's not being publicized, I'll put it that way. Huh? Well, yes, like and that's, that's true, them. but uh, those probably would be institutions that uh, would be quote-unquote savable. What I'm speaking of is institutions that simply haven't been declared, but in reality are uh, bankrupt and but to which innocent people are still investing or depositing now uh, the main cause of the trouble has been that we've had about five money manias in this country in the last 15 years and one of them that hit us the hardest in Texas before the bust in the energy thing was that you had this uh, phony multiplication of value of real estate. Oh, yeah. And then the capitalization of that SNL based on this very fraudulently inflated value. I know of situations in this area of San Antonio alone in which you had tracks that had been purchased at $100 an acre that ended up being capitalized at $10,000 an acre. Can you give us a scenario of how the impending depression might occur? Well, as I said, I'm really an optimist by nature. The, uh, it takes a lot of optimism now. <laughs> well, it's true, but, and I believe in anticipatory. This is a reason, the only reason I'm, I get demoralized, or tend to do, is that I have seen for years, you know, what we could do and that we should anticipate doing, and nobody wants to discuss it. This has been the hallmark of my public activity. When I was on the city council, I developed that approach, and I was able to work it. That's another subject matter. But right now, the thing that I fear the most is that um, the United States and the president revealed its absolute bankruptcy, his bankruptcy at the Venice conference this last May. And every single nation wrote about it. I read the German press. I read the French press. I read the Madrid press. 
I read the select South American press, and let me tell you, it's bad for a country because this president is bankrupt. And the nations were crying for some input of leadership, and we couldn't give it. And uh, uh, we're, we're, we've been bankrupt, and it's going to take the coordinated effort. The only thing that has saved us has been the fear of the industrial countries that if the United States goes, they go with them. That's why they're propping us up then. That's right. That's why they have, because they realize that uh, we're too inter interdependent now. So that if you have, and God forbid, I pray every night we don't, because really it's senseless in this day and time. It's senseless. We shouldn't have to have the faces. But if you do, it will be on a global scale what we had nationally, domestically in, in the 30s. Loss of confidence run on the system. What should uh, the policy of the United States be? What, what kind of action can be taken to help stave off this collapse? Well, it's so interconnected that there's no simplistic. It would take a series of actions, not the least of which would be to, uh, on a national level, join these other countries, exert leadership and say, all right, now you fellows are all in the same boat with us. And what we say we've got to do is uh, stabilize the international situation. And you can't stabilize it if you're speculating against this very same dollar. These are these three, four, five hundred billion dollars every day. The whole thing is shaky. And, and what is it? It's speculating on the dollar. And you can't, that's what Volcker was trying to get at. The only way you can do that is stabilize by a stable currency system, such as we were supposed to have had before 1971. All it takes right now worldwide is for some little thing to happen. This is a reason why they have played along with rolling over, not paying, but rolling over the interest payments of the debtor nations like Mexico and Brazil. If one of them should totally declare a moratorium and default and say we're not going to pay anything, even interest, that would be the little thread that would pull the fabric apart. Now let's have some more news stories from alternative publications. By the way, we'll show the names and addresses of some of these after the program. Everybody's looking now at the Reagan legacy, what hath Reaganomics wrought over the last eight years, and I have a few things to pass on to you. The first is from the Left Business Observer, uh, a little newsletter out of New York City that uh, provides some good numbers for you number crunchers. For instance, they say that the top 2% of U.S. households now own 54% of all financial assets. That's a familiar uh, proportion there. In July, the Census Bureau reported that the top fifth of U.S. households got 46.1% of family income. And the lowest fifth only got 3.8%. And he says that's the most lopsided distribution in the 40 years that they've been collecting this data. Now, what this may mean to you and I, here's something that I found very interesting. You know, the Reagan administration made a big deal about the fact that women are now earning 70% of what uh, men make. And wow, that's great. But they, what they don't tell you, the reason it's risen from set to 70% from 63% eight years ago was because it's... There's a, there is indeed a narrowing gap between men and women, but it's not because women are doing so much better, it's because men are coming down in pay as they are farmed off into more of the service sector. And also from the, the nation, continuing, continuing on with the Reagan legacy, they say in the nation that the Center on Budget and Policy Priorities came up with a study that said despite an agreement between the White House and Congress to preserve low-income non-entitlement programs, the total 1988 appropriations in that area fell $750 million below the level they would have had to retain the same services and benefits at the 1987 levels. From fiscal 1981 to 88, after adjusting for inflation, the center says that such spending is down 54%. Since 81, housing subsidies have been cut by $32 billion, accounting for roughly three quarters of the overall decrease. But in the same period, the number of homeless Americans has risen dramatically, and we've seen that time and again, not just on the, the local news. 
also slashed during the Reaganomics period were job training for welfare recipients down 81 percent, housing assistance for the elderly and handicapped down 47 percent, and legal services for the poor down 28 percent. And they say, they conclude, yet another way to judge the Reagan years. The poverty rate in 1986, which is the latest year for which figures are available, is higher than the poverty rate for any year in the 1970s. And that includes the recession of 1974-75. In the same article, they continue on Reagan Legacy Part 2. They say, the theory behind the Reagan cuts in low-income programs was that the states and the munificent private sector would rush in to fill the gap. <laughs> Of course, we know how that's gone. In fact, a nationwide survey of state child care programs conducted by the Children's Defense Funds lays, a, lays that all to rest. The report compared funding of child care for low-income working families in 1987 with that in 1981 and found that 22 states are serving fewer children now than they did in 1981. Only 18 states are serving more, and this is in face of an ever-increasing need for such services. In 1986, according to the Children's Defense Fund, 9.6 million preschool children had mothers in the workforce. And by 1995, that figure is expected to be 15 million. And they conclude, quote, the reduction in federal aid has severely hindered state governments in their efforts to provide adequate child care programs. Some states have used their own money to supplement federal funding, but not enough to offset federal cutbacks and keep pace with the growing demand for safe, decent, and affordable child care. So that's another part of the Reagan legacy. The Nutrition Action Health Letter has a very interesting story about a woman who blossomed after she was 80, at least physically. There's a picture of her, Marilla Salisbury of San Diego, and you look at what a beautiful body she has. You never realize that she turned 80 in August of 1987. She just completed a new record of, of, uh, for a three-mile walk in just under 40 minutes. But it didn't happen overnight. She tells her story. She says, when I was 70 years old, I was so stiff, I couldn't even turn my head enough. I couldn't even bend over and, and uh, tie my shoes. Her husband was in bad shape, too, her husband three years older than she is. So they were driving down the highway one day and saw a health center. They said, heck, let's join this, see, see if we can do something about our bodies. And so they did. So she started exercising five times a week, aerobic dancing and Nautilus machines. And it took her two years, she said, to really get loosened up. And so not only is she in these uh, competitive uh, uh, walk racing um, efforts, but her husband is doing, he walks every day, even though he has a regular heart, and now he's competing in javelin, shot put, discus competitions. It's amazing, and he's 83 years of age. She says she eats very little uh, red meat, she switched to uh, chicken and fruit, eats mainly uh, uh, ch the chicken and fish, that's the only meat, and then she uh, has, she's heavy on the fruit, uh, vegetables, and potatoes. By gosh, it shows that you don't have to, you know, let your body go all to hell just because you're getting older. Beautiful, beautiful story. I have a thing that from New York Times service, it was actually in our Austin paper, and it notes that the, the title of this is entitled, Study Finds a Widening Gap Between Rich and Poor Families. You know, surprise, surprise. <laughs> this is uh, on a study from the Congressional Budget Office. They say, quote, while high and low income families had roughly comparable gains in income during most of the 70s, the incomes of low income families rose only slightly or fell between 79 and 86, while incomes of wealthier families rose sharply. And of course, they say those that were hardest hit were the families with single mothers with children and families headed by people under 25 years old. There's a story in the right wing newspaper, The Spotlight, which indicates just not only how expensive the armament industry and the cost to the taxpayer is now, but what it's doing to the economy and what it's going to do to the economy. It says that the Joint Chiefs of Staff and the military industrial complex aren't telling the American people just the great, enormous expense that will result as a, re as a result of these new electronic wizard weapons, the, the next generation of weapons. They're going to be costing 10, 20, even 100 times more than uh, the conventional ordinance. They've been trying to hide this under the so-called uh, uh, black 
programs that nobody can look into. But they're so bad that there was a there was set up a special uh, team, a commission, commission to look at this. And Felix Rohatton, manager, managing partner of Lazard Frere, and a very important person in the American power structure and the power elite, says that these things are just bankrupting the United States right now, much less in the future. Said the world's leading military, the U.S., has lost its power as an independent nation. A combination of high levels of defense spending and tax cuts turned the United States into an historical anomaly, a first-rate military power, but a second-rate economic power. In fact, uh, uh, Rohatton warned that despite the hundreds of billions of dollars that we've already spent on weapon system, that we have become prisoners to foreign capital to finance all this. And he says this is a classical model of a failing power. The United States is midway between third world status and first world status. Hmm. I found an article in the Village Voice, it was a couple months ago, that is pretty interesting. Uh, follow with me, please, on this story. During the 1920s, uh, old money, this is like the Mellons, the DuPonts, the Rockefellers, they owned a lot of the real estate in New York City, the prime real estate, the apartments, the office buildings. Well, over the years, in the 20s, uh, there was a boom going on, and they sold off a lot of these holdings to the new young lions of real estate, the speculators and developers of their age. And they had a great time, and they were making all kinds of money left and right until the crash of 1929. Well, when the crash came, their houses of cards all collapsed. And wouldn't you know it, the holdings went at fire sale prices back to the old money, the Mellons, the Rockefellers, the DuPonts, <laughs> etc. They never lose. Well, they were the only ones that, that, that had the cash to uh, pick up these fire sale bargains. Well, uh, over the years, things sort of righted themselves, and, and the old money that owned this land eventually, particularly in the 60s and 70s and into the 80s, started trying to make some money to, to become more liquid. So they sold them off to the new generation of young speculators and developers. And the Village Voice uh, uh, has chronicled this extensively over the years. There was a, a whole rash of apartments going condo and low-income tenants being forced out and uh, roughed up by the minions of some of these uh, landholders. Well, come the boom this uh, past October 19th, and it's looking like a lot of these projects are not going to go through or they're, they're in serious financial problems that uh, once again we're seeing that the houses of cards collapsing and you know that there are some people out there that can afford to pick up this stuff at a reasonable price which it will shortly be and once again the Mellons, the Rockefellers and the DuPonts will own the major real estate in New York City. There was a very interesting story in the Dallas newspaper recently, the Times Herald by Mary Barino, called Boardroom Burnout. It's talking about the problems which working women have in big business. It says that although women are entering corporate management in record numbers, they're also leaving in record numbers because they find that, hey, that world isn't just the world they thought it was going to be. They're burning out or they're just leaving. They find themselves locked in jobs they don't like. Fortune magazine uh, reported in 1987 that one out of every four of the MBA female types in the United States have abandoned their jobs after only 10 years in the workforce. Now, part of the problem is that they have, have um, unrealistic expectations of the corporate world dominated by the male ethic. They think that uh, things are going to be on a fair and equal basis if where they will be valued and they will be uh, elevated, promoted if they do a good job. This just doesn't happen in the corporate world. There's a book called Success and Betrayal, The Crisis of Women in Corporate America, written by Sarah Hardesty. She went through this, and she says that women expect their companies to give them approval and protection in a way the men don't expect. Also, women are not adept at the power politics and machinations and, and manipulations of the corporate uh, political system. Uh, women just aren't tuned into this. They don't like it. They don't like to play it. Plus, men keep the women out of that as much as they can. They'll let them work 80 hours a week and then take the fruit of their labor, but they won't let them into the holy of holy inner circle. So women expect their jobs to make them feel fulfilled, but they find that it just doesn't happen. Just doesn't happen.
Corporate America is still run by men, according to Mary Barano. The good old boy network is still alive and in place. But there's still only one group of our people who can have babies, and that's women. What's that old joke? If, if men could have babies, then abortion would be a sacrament? <laughs> <laughs> and that's Alternative Views for this time. Please join us again and bring a friend or two. We'd like to thank our crew for our news section, Brian Lynch, Sherry Runyon, Daniel DePaula, Beverly Garrett, and Laura Barton. And of course, as is usual, we extend our thanks to Austin Community Television, ACTV. We're also very appreciative of the people down in San Antonio with the Rogers Cable Systems. They provided the crew and the studio facilities for our interview with Congressman Gonzalez. This was done in the studio, which is dedicated strictly for access use in San Antonio. And this was all arranged by our sponsor, Terralita Maverick, who has been active in the San Antonio Cable Club for many years. As a matter of fact, if you would like in San Antonio to produce a program on cable access, call 733-1699. Many people have asked us to give the names and addresses of the publications which we use for news and other source material. The Guardian is a Marxist publication. The address is 33 West 17th Street, New York, New York, 10011. The Spotlight is a right-wing populist publication, 300 Independence Avenue, Southeast, Washington, D.C., 20003. For keeping up with the CIA and other intelligence organizations, it's the Covert Action Information Bulletin, P.O. Box 50272, Washington, D.C., 20004. The National Reporter also covers the CIA, P.O. Box 21279, Washington, D.C., 20009. In These Times is a Democratic Socialist publication, 1300 West Belmont, Chicago, Illinois, 60657. Al-Fajr Palestinian Weekly provides information on what is happening in Israel from the Palestinian point of view. 16 Kroll Street, Hempstead, New York, 11550. Alternative Views is a production of the Alternative Information Network, P.O. Box 7279, Austin, Texas, 78713. Alternative Views shows in many parts of the country and people from these places occasionally write us letters or even call us. You're welcome to do that too. We'd like to hear from you. Goodbye. These are the